Jesus said, yes, I am a king. For this I was born. For this I came into the world to bear witness to the truth. Whoever belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Words taken from St. John's Holy Gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. One of my favorite movies is called Beckett. It was made back in 1964. It stars Richard Burton, as well as Peter O'Toole. It is a film that every Catholic should see, for it tells the life of a real saint, namely the Archbishop of Canterbury, St. Thomas a Beckett. The film begins with a growing friendship between Thomas Beckett and the King of England, Henry II. Their friendship, however, becomes quite strained when Thomas Beckett is made a bishop. As a spiritual shepherd of the Catholic flock, St. Thomas Beckett cannot compromise his Catholic faith in order to get along with King Henry, who is always seeking to control the church, take her lands, and gain access to her weekly collections. Eventually, the confrontation reaches a boiling point when Thomas Beckett excommunicates Lord Gilbert, a nobleman and a friend of the king, because he murdered a priest. And in one of the greatest scenes in movie-making history, you can actually feel the tension. A ceremony is held in a church with St. Thomas Beckett and a dozen monks surrounding him. And all, including the bishop, are holding large lighted candles. The saintly bishop then begins to pronounce judgment against the nobleman to be excommunicated. In the name of God, the all-powerful Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, the bishop begins, we deprive Lord Gilbert, the nobleman, of the communion of the body and blood of our Lord. We separate him from the society of all Christians. We exclude him from the bosom of Holy Mother Church in heaven and on earth. And finally, the bishop ends with those words, We declare him excommunicated, and we judge him condemned to eternal fire with Satan and his fallen angels and all of the damned. With these final words, St. Thomas Becket and all the monks turn over their large candles and stamp them into, into the ground, thus extinguishing each flame. Henry II is enraged at the actions of Becket and cries out, Can no one rid me of this meddlesome priest? Henry's friends interpret the statement as an order. Assassins, therefore, are sent to the monastery where they brutally murder St. Thomas Becket, bishop and martyr. Now, although there are a lot of fictional elements in the film, many in fact, Beckett is based on a true story, including the excommunication scene. Now, what is excommunication? In short, it is the most severe penalty of the Catholic Church that excludes someone or a group from communion with Christ in his one mystical body, the Catholic Church. An excommunicated person or group, therefore, cannot participate in any public worship of the Church, they cannot even come to Holy Mass. They cannot receive the sacraments. They cannot receive any blessings. No indulgences whatsoever. Such excommunicated persons include men like Martin Luther, the famous heretic, as well as that infamous king and adulterer and murderer, King Henry VIII. And yes, even blessed John XXIII, the joyful pope of the 1960s, excommunicated the communist leader of Cuba, Fidel Castro. But it should be noted that any excommunication is meant to be first and foremost, not so much a punishment, but rather a severe correction that hopes to bring about an eventual conversion, future healing. In addition, an excommunication is meant not only to help other, is meant also rather to help other members of the true church by attaching a severe penalty to some sins so that others may not follow such bad example. Back in 1992, something very interesting happened in the American territory known as Guam. On this island, which is west of Hawaii, the population is 96% Roman Catholic. And a bill was in the Guam legislative body that sought to eliminate all elective abortions and with penalties and jail time given to abortion doctors. In their House of Representatives, which numbers some 21 persons, a full 20 happened to be Roman Catholic. When the vote was about to be taken to make this pro-life bill into the law of Guam, the Archbishop of the island publicly stated 
that any Catholic representative that voted against the pro-life bill would be immediately excommunicated. During the entire vote on the floor, the archbishop was in the gallery above witnessing every vote. The vote in favor of the pro-life bill carried unanimously. When the U.S. liberal media heard about this, they were outraged. How dare a Catholic bishop threaten a Catholic lawmaker with such a severe penalty? What about the separation of church and state? The Archbishop of Guam was just following the Holy Gospel and was simply practicing his role as shepherd of the flock like those bishops mentioned the Holy Bible, including St. Paul and St. Timothy. The practice of excommunication is in the sacred scriptures. Did not our blessed Lord state that if one did not listen to Holy Church, then that person was to be treated as a heathen and a tax collector? And consider, too, the case mentioned in one of St. Paul's letters specifically. The moral case was a perverse one, where a man, a member of the church at Corinth, was having relations with his father's wife. Listen to the language used by the apostle regarding the offender. Quote, a man who does a thing like this ought to have been expelled from the community. I have already condemned the man who did this thing as if I were already and actually present. He is to be handed over to Satan, the apostle writes, so that his sensual body may be destroyed and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. Unquote. Now note that St. Paul supports excommunication, but with the goal of ultimately saving the man, his soul. The church does have the right to excommunicate, as does any other group, assembly, or society. Traitors to their country can lose their national citizenship. Teenagers can be expelled from school. Even incorrigible young people can be told to leave the family home if they cannot abide by the family rules. The church is not just any old society. She is literally the mystical body of Christ. She is Christ's presence on this earth And when she speaks, she speaks with his kingly authority, with an authority that has the power of the keys of the kingdom to unlock the gates of heaven, but also to close and lock those same gates. And when the church chooses to excommunicate, which is done rarely, she is stating that the penalized person or group is not just out of communion with the church militant on earth, but also expelled from the church triumphant in heaven. When one is somehow not in communion with the church, he is also not in communion with Christ himself. The kingship of Christ, which we celebrate this morning at Holy Mass, is a kingship shared in by his Holy Church, especially by those shepherds, those bishops that represent Christ the King. His authority to rule and to penalize is also the authority of his chosen instruments. When one hears the authoritative voice of the church, one is hearing the authoritative voice of Christ the King. Now, in decades and centuries past, the shepherds, the bishops of our church, spoke with a powerful voice. And it was a powerful voice that people heeded because the King was speaking. Up in Boston, Massachusetts, where I come from, there was an incident back in the 1930s that proved this point. The governor of the Bay States at that time wanted a state lottery in order to increase state revenue. Nearly every member of the state legislature was on board agreeing to the state lottery. But then it happened. One day before the vote, the Archbishop of Boston, Cardinal William O'Connell, weighed in. He said, I am opposed to the state lottery, for it might bring about out-and-out gambling to the state and would be a source of corruption and demoralization, unquote. The next day, the vote was taken, and the state lottery bill lost by a whopping 187 votes to 40. The Cardinal Archbishop of Boston at that time had clout, power amongst his flock and power within society. And because of his influence and his flock's willingness to follow, Cardinal O'Connell was able to stop the spread of communism within labor unions in Massachusetts, as well as stopping the legalization and distribution of contraceptives. Catholics at one time were a robust community back in that, those days. 
their loyalty to Christ the King and His Holy Gospel was well demonstrated. More than 80% of Catholics in that Boston Archdiocese attended Sunday Mass every week. Parishioners were hearing the truth preached from the pulpit, while their children heard the truth from the nuns in the parochial schools. The single most important social influence in Boston at that time was not the newspapers, not politicians, but rather the Holy Roman Catholic Church. And society was far, far better because Christ's kingship was at least partly recognized. Now, what about the present situation up in the Bay State? Well, suffice it to say that Massachusetts was the first state to legalize the abomination of sodomitical marriage. And as I mentioned two weeks ago, Massachusetts also has a referendum on the ballot this November to legalize assisted suicide. And polls show that it will probably pass. With the clerical scandals in that state and the archdiocese having less than 20% of people attending Mass each Sunday, the influence of Christ the King and His Holy Gospel seemed utterly absent. And this situation is not just present up in the north, but throughout the United States and the Western world. The bishops seem powerless, and the flock seems confused and even lost. Consider, for example, the presidential election of 2008. One of the candidates that ran for the presidential office told Planned Parenthood, which is the largest provider of abortions and sterilizations in the world, that the first thing he would do as president would be to sign the Freedom of Choice Act, a governmental law that would forbid any state from in any way limiting abortion rights, including the horror of partial birth abortions. And yes, this same candidate, while a state senator in Illinois, would not support even the Born Alive Act. That is, he would not support medical attention to a baby that survived an abortion. Let it die. In short, this man was the single most pro-abortion politician that we have ever seen in the history of this nation. Now, the voice of the bishops, to be fair, was basically clear about voting pro-life back in 2008. Consider, for example, just one statement made by Bishop Rene Grisita of Texas, who in a radio advertisement that ran for weeks and weeks before the election in both English and Spanish said the following, quote, This is Bishop Rene Grisita reminding all Catholics they must vote in this election, 2008, with an informed conscience. He continued, A Catholic cannot be said to have voted in this election with a good conscience if they have voted for a pro-abortion candidate. The bishop concludes, quote, Barack Hussein Obama is a pro-abortion candidate, unquote. Now, I could provide you literally with dozens and dozens and dozens of examples from our bishops, our shepherds, that represent Christ the King, who is the ultimate executive lawmaker and judge. But when the final vote was tallied back in 2008, it was found that more than 54% of Roman Catholics voted for the pro-abortion candidate and for his quote-unquote Catholic pro-abortion vice presidential candidate. Can we say, therefore, that there is perhaps a disconnect between the shepherds and the majority of their flocks? Can we state without exaggerating that there is a mutiny on board the ship of the church in the United States? Can we say that all these statements made by the bishops largely fell on deaf ears and that it is high time that we see some action as opposed to all these words and sermons and speeches? We have a vice president in our country that receives Holy Communion every single week without exception. A vice president who recently stated in a debate that his Catholic faith, quote, defines who he is as a man. Yes, this Irish Catholic, this Catholic hypocrite from Scranton, Pennsylvania, and former senator from Delaware, has been one of the biggest promoters of abortion for years. Furthermore, the Health and Human Services Department head, a Catholic woman named Kathleen Sebelius, has been a major player 
in an attack upon the Catholic institutions of our country with a so-called HHS mandate. This mandate would first force such Catholic institutions to provide insurance coverage for immoral, unnatural perversions against the Ten Commandments. You see, the present administration in our nation's capital is not just satisfied with us tolerating their evil. They want us to participate in it. Although the bishops, the representatives of Christ the King, have no material arms, they have no tanks, no weapons of mass destruction, they do have weapons, spiritual weapons at their disposal that have worked in the past on many occasions, namely the power to speak loudly through action, the power to excommunicate, to expel from union with Christ and the Church those who will not abide by our ways. Over the past few years, a handful, just a handful of bishops have already started to make corrections by warning some Catholic politicians not to receive Holy Communion who are supporters of abortion. And this should be obvious to the offender, because if one is not in communion with the faith and the way of Christ, then why in heaven's name would anyone receive communion? But these admonitions, these warnings, it must be stated, lack the punch, if you will, of a penalty of excommunication. And if and when there are excommunications, and there will be one day, the ship of the church will be tossed about violently. She will be attacked in the media and maybe even threatened by the government itself. But if this happens, the bishops will be able to imitate Christ the King evermore, who was crowned not with gold, but with thorns. As a final note to all traditional-minded Catholics in particular, who may be struggling with their decision to vote this coming November in the presidential election, there are objections to both candidates, although one is far more offensive to us than the other. Obviously, no one in this congregation would even think about casting a vote for the present occupant in the White House. He is a radical revolutionary that seeks to overturn the very last vestiges of whatever Christian order might be left in this nation. He is an icon of the culture of death and the sodomitical agenda. And with that being stated, however, traditional minded Catholics still struggle, since the other option, though better, is still far from perfect. Although he has spoken out against experiments on little embryos, this candidate still fails to satisfy fully since he allows exceptions for abortion. Furthermore, although he does seem to support traditional marriage and reject the notion of sodomitical marriage, his position is quite politicized, especially if you look at his past actions when governor of the state of Massachusetts. But some in the traditional community, I believe, go too far in regards to their views on this presidential election. Some individuals, for example, are claiming that to vote for the challenger is sinful and evil, for he allows exceptions to abortion. They point to statements made by bishops, priests, and educated laymen, which state that voting for a candidate who allows abortion is wrong, plain, and simple. One should either vote for a third-party candidate that is fully in line with the natural law or not vote at all. Now, I would never condemn one who decided to leave the ballot blank on the chief executive, and I would never fault anyone for voting for a candidate representing a minor party with no chance to win. But what I do find fault with are those supposed purists who claim that a vote for the governor of Massachusetts, the former governor, would somehow be mortally or even venally sinful. The one-time head of the Holy Office, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, taught the following, quote, a Catholic would be guilty of formal cooperation with evil if he were to deliberately vote for a candidate because of that candidate's permissive stand on abortion. But the good cardinal then added, quote, When a Catholic does not share a candidate's stand in favor of abortion, but votes for that candidate for other reasons, it is considered remote material cooperation, which can only be permitted in the presence of proportionate reasons, unquote. A lot of moral theology there. 
cooperation issues, formal or remote, issues of proportionate reasons. Proportionate reasons is the key phrase. But considering that human body life is the highest natural good we have, what proportionate reasons could possibly be present that would allow one to vote for a candidate who supported abortion in any way whatsoever? The only possibility is that the other candidate in the race, the opponent, would allow for even more abortions, more euthanasia, more evil. Again, the cardinal is saying that one could vote for a candidate who allows for abortion in limited cases when the alternative candidate promotes abortion far, far more. The goal, then, of the Catholic voter, in some cases, is simply to limit the evil. We live in a valley of tears, a fallen world. Again, one could choose not to vote for president or vote for a third-party candidate that fully embraced the natural law. That's true. This would be fine, especially if you were voting in a state like Alabama or Wyoming. But if you live in a state like Ohio, where the election could either go either way, it literally could decide the next four years. I would carefully discern your voting decision. The man who lives on Pennsylvania Avenue right now is an enemy of life. He's an enemy of marriage. He's your enemy, and he's my enemy. He's an enemy of the church, and he's literally an enemy of God. No exaggeration there. In this valley of tears that is the earth, where evil often seems to have the upper hand, we must do all within our power to limit, at least, the advance of evil as we wait for that joyful day and coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who will save this universe, for he is king of it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.